you're up. All right. Sounds great. Sound is still good. All right. Awesome. If it is not, just jump in and let me know. Um, so hi again. Um, my name is Brianna Povener, and I work at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. at the National Museum of Natural History. Um, I'm a paleoanthropologist, and that means I study human evolution, and I am particularly interested in what people ate a long time ago. And you'll have to excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold, so hopefully I won't be coughing too much. Um, but what I want to do is give you a little overview of kind of my career path and talk a little bit about the questions I'm interested in and some projects I've been working on lately. Um, and then I just really want to open it up to question and answer to be able to hear what people are, um, what you guys are interested about. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen and then I'm going to hit slideshow. Let's see if I can do this. Great. Okay. So as I mentioned, I'm a research scientist. I study human evolution. I also do a lot of outreach. Um, so I'm an educator at the National Museum of Natural History. So you can see kind of these two parts of my job. This is me actually taking photos of elephant fossils and in the National Museums of Kenya um, and on the left. And then this is me talking with um, a group of students in kind of one of our outreach spaces at the Natural History Museum. So I'll talk a little bit about how I got here. Um, I did my undergrad degree at a place called Bryn Mawr College right outside of Philadelphia. Um, when I started college, and um, really in middle school and high school, I um, thought science was great, but I didn't think it was for me. Um, I thought I wanted to maybe be an English major or um, be a writer. And then I got to college and I had an amazing anthropology professor. I never heard of anthropology and my college advisor, as I was looking for a fourth class to take my first semester, said, why don't you try anthropology? And I said, I don't know what that is. And she told me it was a study of people, which I thought sounded really cool. So had this amazing professor um, realize that there were lots of things in science still to discover <laughs> and that I might be part of that. And then after my third year of college, I went on a field school in South Africa, excuse me, um, where I was able to actually like learn how to look for fossils and dig in some archaeological excavations. And I was like, oh, this field work stuff is great. So I got really interested and hooked on that. And I've really been doing it ever since. Um, I went to graduate school at Rutgers University. That's the that's a picture of the building where my office was at Rutgers, and I spent seven and a half years um, getting my PhD. Um, and then I started um, a fellowship at the Smithsonian where I work now to help, in part to help um, do research, but also put together what you see on the right, this beautiful exhibit on human evolution. Um, I mentioned I do a lot of public engagement. Um, the picture on the left is in that outreach space called Curious, where we have a replica. Um, that day I was out there with a replica of an early human fossil talking with groups of kids. Um, and on the right, I'm doing some um, outreach in Kenya. So at a site where I've done research since 2005 in southern Kenya called Lorgasile, we in 2009 had the first big educator workshop. So we took museum educators and teachers actually to our field site to be able to look around. And this is a, um, a site museum at our field site. So that was super fun. But I want to talk to you about what really fascinates me and my key questions that I'm interested in asking, which is, what did people eat in the past? Um, and I'm interested in what people ate in the past because that tells us a lot about how different species on the human family tree were adapted. What kinds of foods were they eating? How did they get those foods? How did they spend time going out and like searching for them? Were they bringing them back to one place? Were they, when they started to eat meat, which is a big question I'm interested in, were they scavenging animals? Were they hunting animals? Did they come in contact with, like you see that picture on the right, that's a big replica saber tooth skull. How did eating meat put us in danger and in conflict with some big carnivores if we were trying to scavenge from them or compete with them? Um, in being able to get carcasses. And the way that I do my studies is that I look at marks on bones, on animal fossils, left either by early humans with sharp stone tools cutting meat off of bones, so I know that they were eating those animals, or I also look at predator tooth marks on bones. Um, so here, that, that's I jumped the gun a little bit. Um, so that I look at, basically, I look for those tool marks, and you can see those sharp marks, um, those like linear marks in the picture on the left side made by sharp stone tools. They're very straight, and they're all in patches. The picture on the right is the um, 
bottom part, the back part of a knee joint of um, a leg bone from a zebra that I watched lions eat. And those tooth marks are from lions that were eating that zebra. And the tooth marks and chewing damage look different from those tool marks. And so I spend a lot of time studying fossils and seeing if I can see those marks on bones to figure out who ate what in the past. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of my research projects and the fun stuff I get to do when I go out and do research. Um, this past summer, actually until early September, I was doing field work at a place called Olpegeta Conservancy in Kenya. And there you can see on the bottom right, we're actually walking around looking for modern bones. So even though I'm an archaeologist and I study fossil bones, we also do work in the world today. Um, and I'm interested in seeing how carnivores are chewing on those bones. Are the animals dying in the places where they're meant to be living, like in those bushy areas versus the areas with open grassland? Um, so we take photos of the bones. We measure them. I look for tooth marks on them. Um, I look for how weathered they are. And then we actually leave them in place. So we're not collecting anything in this project. Um, this is one of my field work highlights. Oh, and I need to actually update this because um, I did field work in 2011 when I was pregnant with my son, who's now in seventh grade. Um, I brought him with me when he was six, and I have a matching picture that I should have put in here. I brought him back with me um, to Kenya when he was 12, and we have a picture next to the same equator sign, and he is as tall as I am now. He's 13. Um, that was really fun. Um, I'm also doing studies of fossil animal bones from a site in southern Kenya um, where I've been working since 2005 called Alorga Sile. Um, and so I've been on the excavations for that site for six years where I helped to run the field camp and actually digging fossils out of the ground. But also you see that picture on the right after we dig up the fossils and all of them go in individual plastic bags with a label and a card then I actually have to take them out again in the museum and study them and figure out what animal are they from? Do they have marks on them? How weathered are they? Um, what bone are they from? And so I spend a lot of time doing this analysis in the museum. Um, this is a little bit of a different project, but one I've been involved with since 2008. Um, and it is actually analyzing fossil footprints made by ancient modern humans. So these footprints are probably somewhere between about 12,000 and 19,000 years old. Um, they were found in Tanzania, um, and my best friend is the person who leads this project, and so I've helped with uncovering the footprints, helping to study them, um, and now we're working on actually um, making a preservation plan to make sure they don't erode away and working with the Tanzanian government to um, hopefully put up like a site museum at this site so that visitors can um, get some good information about these footprints. Um, because I'm interested in what humans do to bones, but also what carnivores do to bones, I can study what modern leopards, lions, cheetahs, um, hyenas do to bones in Africa. But what I can't study today is what saber tooths do to bones because they're not around anymore. So in order to do that, I'm studying a fossil collection from a cave site in Texas um, called Friesenhan Cave, where it looks like these saber tooths were bringing back lots of animals to feed their young. It was a saber tooth den. Um, so looking to see what does it look like when saber tooths actually eat their prey. So that's been really fun. Um, I also did a study starting in 2017. I mentioned I most of the time I look at animal fossils to see what um, early humans ate, but I was actually studying the early human fossils um, to see what ate them. Um, and surprisingly, as I was doing some of this research, I found that sometimes the early humans were eating the other early humans. So last year I published a paper on this particular fossil, which you see on the right, it's part of a leg bone from an early human that had butchery marks by other early humans. So some of the earliest evidence probably for cannibalism for people eating each other. That was a big surprise and I did not expect to find that when I started to do this study. Um, I've also been working with a team in Romania, um, re-studying fossil collections that were excavated like 40 or 50 years ago, um, because in <clears throat> going back and looking at them more carefully, this team started to see what they thought were some butchery marks on these bones. So we did um, some work here in 2019 and then again in 2022. And probably in the next couple of months, we will have a big paper coming out. Um, that shows that those butchery marks tell us that early humans were in Europe almost 2 million years ago. So this is actually going to be the oldest evidence for fossil humans in Europe. So, excuse me, keep your eyes out in the news for that paper. Um, 
And one of the most recent projects that I joined was um, uh, studying, <coughs> excuse me, fossil collections in the Czech Republic. Um, this is a really cool project. It's not as old as those fossils from Europe, which are about 1.9, from Romania, about 1.95 million years old. These fossils from a site called Shedmosti are um, a couple dozen thousand years old. So maybe like 20, between 20 and 30,000 years old. And this is a site where we have lots of stone tools left by early humans, lots and lots and lots of mammoths, um, but also a lot of either dogs, early domesticated dogs or wolves. Um, and the story of this site is that people were probably hunting the mammoths um, and they were potentially actually feeding. There's a lot of reindeer fossils. They were maybe feeding the reindeers to these early domesticated dogs. So we went and studied the reindeer fossils to see if we could support this hypothesis. Were people actually feeding um, reindeer or maybe hunting reindeer and giving them to these sort of wild wolves that they were trying to tame into dogs. Um, and the story is actually not as simple as we thought it was. It looks like actually people are probably butchering and eating a lot of these reindeer. So that's it's always fun to find something kind of surprising. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I just wanted to give you kind of a little taste of the research that I'm working on, a basis of how I do my research. I spend time both excavating fossils from the ground, walking around in a modern landscape. The picture behind me is from that site I mentioned, Old Pejeta Conservancy. There's a little um, zebra skull on the ground right there. Um, and just some of the research projects that I'm working on now. So um, I want to open it up to questions. And I know Mr. Amster said that um, I was supposed to, and I think it may be a user error on my end that I did not see the questions that have come in already. So I don't know if you'd be able to ask those. I can put them into the chat. I think at least Perfect. some of them might be students that would prefer not to be on screen. That's if fine. That would like to be on screen if you want to come on up. You can come line up. I'll turn the camera on and ask your questions. Thank you. But yes, if you could put them in the chat, and I'm so sorry if I if I like missed an email or didn't see those, but I'm happy to answer questions when you put them in the chat. Thank you. Um. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, um, I have like a really low patience level. Does your job ever feel like really <laughs> tedious or repetitive? Yes, that's a great question. Um, I, I feel like I actually have a pretty good patience level, which is good. So it does sometimes feel tedious. So particularly when I'm doing excavating and you're like, I'm digging, I'm digging, I'm finding nothing, I'm finding nothing. Like, what am I? Um, and so sometimes it can feel tedious. But I think to me, even when I'm doing things and not instantly finding things or making discoveries, there's always the possibility that like the next time I, you know, brush dirt away, I could find something and that excitement still holds me. Um, and when I'm walking around in the modern wildlife conservancy, sometimes I'm like, I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm not seeing bones, but then I'm like, oh, look, there's giraffes over there. There's elephants over there. So like, there's often things that still keep me engaged, even if the thing that I'm looking for is not something I'm finding. So eh, that's a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was wondering, like, how can you tell whether it's like, uh, you know, tooth marks or like with the tools versus just like regular bone imperfections? That is an amazing question. And the answer is, um, there's a couple of answers. One is that sometimes we can't. And sometimes I can look at a mark on a bone and go, I don't actually know what made that. Um, another answer to that question is that with big enough sample sizes, we start to see that the shapes of those marks tend to be different. So if you're making a mark with like a sharp edge of a stone tool, it tends to be straight, it tends to be narrow, it tends to have kind of go to a point at the bottom, it tends to be V-shaped at the bottom, and marks with teeth tend to be more, oh, here, I'll wait till that's done. Um, and marks with teeth tend to be rounder. They tend to be kind of in a different pattern and also sometimes in a different place. So with big samples, we can get some good separation between the shape and kind of pattern of where those marks are. Um, and um, knowing whether it's just sort of like, is this a natural part of the bone? That's a lot of just time spent looking at bones and getting a good sense of what their shape is. But sometimes I pick up a bone and I'm like, uh, you know, especially a fossil bone when you're like, is this mark left from a tool? Is it a tooth? Is it because it rolled around in a river and scratched on a sand grain? Um, is it because an animal stepped on it and it was in like a rocky area? So kind of trying to rule those things out can be really tricky. It's a great question. And actually, 
people publish papers on this kind of thing all the time, still trying to refine and get at um, um, how to answer that question. So that's a really good one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Besides like uh, what these early hominins ate, um, what is like your favorite species to study? Ooh. So I think my favorite species would be Homo erectus. Um, and that's a species that went originated almost 2 million years ago, persisted until like less than maybe 150,000 years ago. So they're the longest lived species on the human family tree. So that's really impressive to me. Our species has been around for about 300,000 years. They've been around many times longer than Homo sapiens than us. Also, they're probably the first species that migrated out of Africa and the first species that probably incorporated more meat and animal food in their diet. So I, I think they're they're pretty cool. They're my favorite. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, for how many years have you been doing your job? That's a good question. So I started in <coughs> working at the Natural History Museum in 2005, so almost 20 years ago. Um, and I was I was doing sort of part of my job at that point, but I got my permanent position in 2008. So I guess like 16 years. OK, thank you. Sure. Um, what's the biggest fossil you found? Ooh, biggest fossil I found. Um, it's a good question. Probably. <clears throat> um. I have found at that site at Alorga Sile when um, one of the places where we excavate has an elephant butchery. So like some of those elephant bones, rib bones and leg bones, they we don't usually find them complete or whole. Sometimes they're broken up, but like long rib bones from elephants are probably some of the biggest fossils that I found. They're really big. What was the oldest fossil you found? Um, so the oldest fossil I found, the oldest layer that I've excavated in is in a site in Tanzania called um, Old Divide Gorge. And that layer is about 1.8 million years old, almost 2 million years old. That excavation was really cool. We were digging in a place that used to be a very quiet lake. Thank you. Um, and so the fossils we were finding were like hippo teeth and um, fish um fish bones and crocodile teeth so like all these things that basically were living in this big lake and died and settled to the bottom and the cool thing was actually because so fossils are the color they are because of the minerals and the sediments where they get preserved and for some reason there were pink minerals so a lot of these fossils were pink colored which i thought was cool thank you so uh out of all the dig sites you were you've worked at which one was your favorite to work at Oh, that's such a hard question because a lot of them were really fun. Um, I think in some ways the the footprint site called Ingari Cerro was maybe my favorite to work at for a couple of reasons. One is that it was like you were, you know, as we were brushing off the footprints, you're like, it's almost like I'm watching these ancient people walk in front of me. Um, and it's a special kind of evidence seeing footprints like people were here. They were stepping here. 19,000 years ago. Um, so I think, and also there were footprints of like, there was a footprint of like a track from a little kid. Um, there were like people moving in different directions. So it felt like I was really reconstructing behavior. So I think, you know, in many ways, that's my favorite. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple extra from the, <clears throat> from there. My Thank favorite you. question, and remember last year, our, our, uh, our favorite hominid question, but this one, is equally good. Has oh. hmm, has island dwarfism branched off from the species Homo floresiensis to other species? Yeah. Awesome question. So Homo floresiensis is a great example of island dwarfism. And we see this in mammals where when a mammal species gets from kind of a big mainland to an island, oftentimes because of resource constraints, they don't have a lot of food. Evolving small is a great way to survive. Um, that's probably what we think happened with Homo floresiensis. So we have fossils of the species dating between around 50 and 100,000 years ago. Very recent in human evolutionary history, we tend to see a big body size increase and Homo floresiensis is tiny. Um, so yeah, island dwarfism is a the, I think the sort of favorite hypothesis of why they're so small. We do not see this in other island species that I know of so far. 
but we don't have, there's an, a relatively new species that was found a couple of years ago called Homo luzonensis in the Philippines. We don't have a lot of good body fossils of Homo luzonensis, so we don't know if they also underwent island dwarfism. Um, but yeah, I think the, the other species on the human family tree, we don't really see island dwarfism um, because a lot of them inhabited much bigger areas. So great question. Uh, next question we have was, <clears throat> what is your favorite hominid fact? Oh, that's a great question. That's my favorite hominid fact. Probably my favorite <clears throat> overall hominid fact is that, well, I have, it, it, okay, two. Um, the one that I mentioned before is like, we haven't, we're not the evolutionary winner. Maybe we're the only one left, but we haven't been around for the longest. So Homo erectus was around and other species were around a lot longer than we were. But probably my favorite hominid fact is that it's a weird time to, in human evolutionary history because there's only one species of hominin. Is that during most of our evolutionary history, there were multiple kinds of hominins walking the earth. I think that's awesome. Come on up. We have a philosophical question. Excellent. I'll try, I try to have a philosophical answer. <laughs> All right, let's see, let's see if they can get through it. Okay, so if um humans became humans because they evolved from apes, why are apes still on Earth? No, that's a great question, actually. And I wrote an article about that exact question with a couple of teachers because it's a really, it's a great question. Um, so humans evolved from ancient apes. They didn't evolve from chimps or gorillas or anything that's living today. Um, and so because humans evolved from those ancient ape ancestors, living apes evolved from those ancient ape, ape ancestors. Um, and so humans, we've done a pretty good job from an evolutionary perspective of being humans and we've survived. Chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, you know, those apes have also basically been successful in what they do as being apes. Um, so it's basically there's there's different evolutionary paths and all the species that are around today have been successful in their own way. So I hope that answers that question. Okay, so this is not technically about evolution, but I think it's a question. Um, so if extinction is a natural part of our life, why do we care about protecting endangered species? species. Yeah, that's an awesome question. And you're right. I mean, it, while you say it's not about evolution, extinction is fully a part of evolution. So I think that's a it's a really good question. Um, I think part of it is because um, endangered species can often play a really important role in ecosystems. Um, some of them are what are called ecosystems engineers, like they they kind of create some of the particular circumstances in ecosystems. And if some of those species go extinct, they change ecosystems either in ways that we won't really know how to predict or they'll change them in ways that have really negative effects for us and for other organisms and for the ecosystems in general. Um, so, and also having a really healthy ecosystem often depends on like high numbers of species and biodiversity. Um, so I hope that like starts to answer that question. That's a good question. Hey, could there ever be like more than one species of hominin again? That's an awesome question. I think the answer in theory is yes. Um, I don't think it's likely to happen. So the way that speciation usually happens is either you get a small group of a species that is living in what's called reproductive isolation. Like they're only hanging out with themselves. They're only reproducing with themselves. Um, because we are so connected as humans today, it's unlikely that like a small group would sort of exist by themselves and then spend so long in isolation that they would like, you know, random mutations would happen, those mu mutations would persist. Where I can imagine something like that happening, it's sort of far-fetched, but like, let's say a small group of humans figures out how to live under the ocean in like some kind of, you know, small, 
you know, I don't know, settlement, or if we colonize another planet. I think like those are the sorts of scenarios that you might actually get a different human species. But because we are all part of the same species today um, and really well connected, I think it's pretty unlikely that like given our current circumstances, we're going to see another human species evolve. Thank you. Mm hmm when did humans start like the most basic level of farming as in just having their little section of edible fruits that they protect from other creatures? That's a great question. So probably starting like somewhere around 20 to 25,000 years ago, we start to see that like earliest farming. So we see exactly like you said, it's not necessarily like intense planting, but it might be, you know, sort of cultivating. It might be protecting plants from, you know, other things eating them. It might be coming back to the same places over and over again. So I would say probably somewhere starting maybe 20, 25,000 years ago, that process started. And maybe by about 15,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago, we start to see it like really settle in, in different places in the world. So why do you think humans have outstripped all the other species uh, instead of other species surviving too? That's such an awesome question. The real honest answer is we don't know and I don't know. But there are a few ideas about why modern humans are so successful and no other hominins are around. One is that we are so cooperative and so social and that we are able to like, you know, trade like in, in early times there, we were like trading with other groups while maybe some like Neanderthals, let's say, had small populations. They were very isolated. So cooperation is a potentially a big part of it. Our like very rich social lives are a big part of it. <laughs> and modern humans can be very altruistic. Like we will give food and money and other resources to people that we might not have ever met. Um, but it really, I think like the best hypothesis I think around is really just about our ability to cooperate. There's there's kind of a joke in the scientific community, a big difference between humans and chimpanzees who are our closest living relatives with cooperation. If you put a bunch of chimps on a plane and flew them from one place to another, like there would be major fights on that plane and a lot of chimps probably wouldn't survive. You put a bunch of humans on the plane and like we line up, we're really calm about it, we cooperate with each other. So it's that sort of amazing ability to cooperate that might be part of our success. Okay. We have another one from the audience. Mm -hmm. You mentioned when you worked in Europe, but what <clears throat> hominid were you uh, studying at that time? Ah, it's a good question. So for the project in Romania that the fossils date back to about 1.95 million years ago, we don't have any hominin fossils. We don't know what hominin it was. I think it was probably Homo erectus is the most likely candidate, um, which would be, again, that like pretty early out of Africa. There's a site in the Republic of Georgia called Dimonisi that has hominins from around that time that are Homo erectus. Um, at the site in the Czech Republic, Shen Mosti, that's definitely modern humans. That's Homo sapiens about 30,000 years ago. By that and time, my, there's no other hominins left in Europe. So it's got to be Homo sapiens. And my last question is, we have we have several students in here that studied the Denisovans. Oh, yeah. They were, <clears throat> they're very passionate about it. Um, <laughs> they were curious about, like, when would the Latin name, like, how, like why don't they have a Latin name? Yeah. Are they, like... When is that coming? Yeah, it's such a good question. And it is so frustrating because they don't have a Latin name. We don't, we like, we don't put them on our family tree because they don't have this genus and species name. So what we need in order for Denisovans to be like designated a species as opposed to just sort of a population that we talk about, we really need probably good cranial fossils, skull fossils, more teeth. Um, so the way that species are named are based on their morphology, their size and shape, and are they different enough from other species? So I think we have to find Denisovan fossils that we know are Denisovan because of genetic evidence, but also like pre-complete um, skull fossils. So if we get, get a skull fossil that we know is Denisovan because we can extract DNA from it, then I think they're going to be named with a latin name but i know i agree it's really it's very frustrating and i hope that happens sometime soon we have one more student coming up mm -hmm. um how do we know the brain size of the denisovans if we don't have like skulls or anything 
I don't know that we do know the brain size of the Denisovans. That's a good question. There is a skull that has been attributed to um, Denisovans or Denisovans, um, basically based on kind of how old it is and what it looks like. But it's it's a it's a guess at this point. Um, so we would use that skull and say, you know, we know the brain size of this skull. We think this skull is a Denisovan. But until we have one that is definite, it's like, well, this is our best guess of how big their brains were. Well, um, I speak, I think, for all the students who are now going to say what? <laughs> You're very welcome. Great questions. Excellent. Um, I'll just turn off the recording. But again, this was great. Thank you. You're very welcome. No, these are wonderful questions.